Arunang karuna tarangitakshi Drita pasang kusha pushpa bana chapam Anima di biravritam mayukhai Raham mityeva vibhavaye bhava Brahmo Pendra Mahendradi Deva Sangstuta Vaibhava Hara Netra Agni Sandagdha Kama Sangjiva Naushadhi Namaste. So these are the last two namas in the section about her killing Bhandasura. And now we start to see a pattern emerge that in the Lalita Sahasranama, there are different sections arranged in a certain way. And what is this pattern? It is the cumulative realization of Brahman, both the Nirguna Brahman and Saguna Brahman. So, in other words, her different descriptions and names are not in just arbitrary order. It's not just for poetic convenience that they're arranged in a certain way, but rather they introduce the subjects, the topics of contemplation that gradually lead to complete self-realization. So this is very profound. Uh, that the way that this Sahasranama is written actually guides us on the path of self-realization from the beginning to the end. It begins with a long section. Well, first it begins with the Dhyana Shloka, which we chant in the beginning of every video. Actually, there are four Dhyana Shlokas, which you can read if you download the book. And then there is a description of her physical form, her bodily form, from the head to the feet, complete description. Then there's a description of how she killed Bandasura. And of course, Bandasura represents the ego. He's the fool, the clown, the joker. Huh? So this joker, this, this idiot, <laughs> the ego, keeps us entrapped and his brother uh, Shukrasura, <laughs> the semen demon, <laughs> lust, keeps us entrapped in this material world and they make us slaves. That's what the demons do. They like to have slaves. They don't believe in freedom. Huh? So the demons in the form of, of ego and lust and, and using those parts of human nature as a lever assume power. And those who are not self-realized, of course, fall right into the trap. Brahamo Pendra Mahendradi Deva Sangstuta Vaibhava Lalita is praised by Brahma, Vishnu, who here is called Upendra, and Shiva, who is called here Mahendra. So Upendra and Mahendra and Brahma, they all praise her. Now you see, there is no conflict. There is no misunderstanding between the Shaivites, the Shaktas, and the Vaishnavas because their gods all get along. They're all related. Huh? Lalita is Vishnu's sister. You see, so, and Lakshmi is the sister of Shiva. So they're all part of one big family. They all get along. And even if there are some sometimes conflicts among them, 
that they resolve them themselves. Huh? They, they, we don't need to get involved in that. That's fair family business. Huh? It's none of our business. So actually, all the main gods are united in their view. They each have their areas of responsibility and they each take care of their own business and their business together with each other. There's no need for us to get involved in petty sectarian squabbles about who is more supreme. huh? Because in bhakti, the supreme is as you see it, according to your taste, according to your liking, in fact, your imagination. Huh? Because really only Brahman is supreme. These various forms that Brahman appears in are simply for the creation, maintenance, and destruction of the physical universe. And that's an illusion. It doesn't really exist. Actually, it was never born. Huh? That's the, the view of the Ajatta platform, Ajatta Vada. So from this platform, these are just pastimes, Leela. Huh? So don't get so caught up and, and don't let others get caught up in these, these petty squabbles over who is the Supreme, you know? <laughs> the Supreme reveals himself, Brahman reveals himself in many, many forms, according to taste, time and circumstance. So that's all we need to know about this. Oh yeah, Vaibhava means, and, and Sangstuta means internal. And Vaibhava means praise. So this is going on internally, see, among the different forms of the Godhead. And it's not something we need to get involved in, but it's something we need to know about, that they all get along and they love each other. So Nama 84. Harane Tragni Sandagda Kama Sangjivanaushadhi Manmata, Cupid, god of love, was burnt by Shiva for disturbing his meditation. But then Lalita reconstituted him. What's the meaning of this? Well, we, we talked about how Bandasura and other demons use lust in order to control people. Uh, just look at any advertisement on the media. Sex sells. So they use beautiful men and women as models, isn't it? To advertise their product. And this is called positioning. So the demons use positioning of sex to entrap people by their lust. But then Lalitai revives Cupid, but then he exists only in a subtle form. And she, of course, being the most beautiful woman in the creation, attracts everyone's desire. And we'll see it if we read in the Shastras, in the Devi Bhagavatam especially, and also the Tripura Rahasya, there are many stories of demons approaching her with lust, and of course they're getting smashed. <laughs> but she revived Manmata, Cupid, in a subtle form to help the demigods control the human beings, to engage them in religion. See, religion is not for people who are self-realized. Religion is a preliminary stage for those who are approaching the process of self-realization. The real process of self-realization is completely internal. It doesn't involve any rituals or prayers or mantra uh, because actually we are the Supreme. Everything is the Supreme. <laughs> but in the beginning, we can't realize that because we're stuck in dualistic consciousness. So religion gives us a way to connect with the Supreme while still in duality. And this is why there's so many mantras and prayers and rituals and scriptures and different practices to regulate human life. And these are all done with the promise 
of going to a heavenly place in the next life, isn't it? Every single religion uses the same thing. Well, this is lust. This is desire. I don't want to live in this trashy old material world, huh? This slum of the earth planet, this, <laughs> this barrio, huh? I don't want to live here. This is a mess. This is horrible. People are nasty to each other. There's no love, really. Huh? It's terrible. Let's get out of here. Let's go to the heavenly planets. So this is a desire. This is a kind of lust. And so she uses Cupid, the, the lust of Cupid, but in a subtle way, not for gross sexuality, but for a good life or better life in the hereafter. And in this way, she gets the humans to obey the scriptures and do the religious rituals to generate the punya, the pious karma, that eventually brings them to self-realization. There's a lot more here. I don't know if I have time. The commentary mentions that when Shiva is angry, Guru can save you. But when Guru is offended, then you're finished. Shiva is not going to help you. He's going to step back and say, hey, this is none of my business. This is between you and your Guru. So why is that? It's because without the help of a guru to show the way, to show the example, to uh, be the form, the human form of someone who is engaged in self-realization and has reached the goal. Without that kind of example, we can't even begin to approach the ultimate. And that's because of our lack of knowledge, experience, and realization. We have to understand what's in the scriptures, but that's very hard to do until you have the experience to back it up. So we have the guru as the example. We have to find a self-realized guru and follow him, approach and serve him. That's the only way out of this mess. I'm sorry. I know people don't like this. They want to be independent and they want to uh, assert that they are self-realized without doing the work to deserve it. That's because of laziness and pride. But that just keeps them stuck in this material world and they can't get the final liberation. You know, it's too bad. But that's the message here, that these gurus, I mean, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, they're the gurus of the whole universe, but they're praising Lalita. See, so they're showing the example. We should also do like that. And then Shiva is Brahman. He's especially Nirguna Brahman, without qualities. So he can't really create the universe independently. So he emanates Lalita, who is Shakti, I mean, his power. He emanates this power and gives her complete power of attorney to create and manage the universe. See, it's just like an executive in a corporation delegates authority to different vice presidents and so on. You know, really, the, the CEO job is a visionary job. He doesn't have any work to do. Nobody can force him to do anything or at least that's the way it should be. So he delegates these different tasks, marketing, product development, engineering, IT, and so on. So in the same way, Shiva, he doesn't have anything to do. He has no desires. He has no attachments. Huh? He's free. So because the the universe exists primarily for the benefit of the conditioned beings. He delegates all the authority to her, to Shakti, and she takes care of managing everything. Uh, and she can be very creative. <laughs> so we worship her because she's the mother. 
if Shiva gets angry, he, he doesn't have any patience, you know, he's like a disciplinarian. If he gets offended, then, you know, he'll just burn you to a crisp like Manmata. But she is more merciful. She will rescue you. She will rehabilitate you. She will give you a role. Uh, she will delegate some authority to you and give you a job in her creation that ultimately will lead you to the final salvation. Om Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum.